Thank you. I appreciate that welcome. I love this church. I love each one of you, my family members, the body of Christ, and I'm so thankful for the opportunity to speak today. Um, before I get to the sermon, I want to do a quick celebration. Bishop allow, is allowing me to do. Um, as many of you know, we uh, do a fundraiser every year for our young people, Move the Mission, and we concluded our campaign uh, just a couple of weeks ago. And so I just wanted to celebrate um, that with you, as many of you had a part. Many young people raised money and gave money. Many of you gave and sponsored and did all kinds of awesome things. Um, so in the state of Connecticut, the District of Connecticut, we set a goal this year for Move the Mission of $50,000 as a district, which was uh, would be an all-time record for us, beating our previous record of $49,000. And when it, all the money was counted up, we beat that record of 49000 and we beat that goal of 50000 So thank you so much for being a part of raising a record $60,000 for Move the Mission in the state of Connecticut. And the number one giving church in the district just so happens to be right here in little old Thompson, Connecticut. You guys gave... $12,360 to move the mission. So thank you so much for doing that. Uh, came in as the highest offering of all the churches in the district. And uh, so that I think that just speaks so well and so highly of, of each of you and of our young people um, and their passion for God and for the kingdom. Uh, we have a program called the Real McCoy Program uh, where a young person is challenged to raise $1,000 um, and personally uh, during the year. And so we actually had four young people who, who met that Real McCoy challenge. Uh, her first year in youth group, Ari Ford, raised uh, well over $1,000. So congratulations to her. Uh, I think she might be in Sunday school, but for the second straight year, Ellie Anna Ford raised over $1,000. So congratulations to her. <clears throat> I don't see Sydney, but she raised over $1,000. Sydney Bales, congratulations to her. And last but not least, Garrett Bales raised over $1,000. Awesome job, Garrett. Garrett was also selected uh, to be our Connecticut Real McCoy uh, representative, and so he's going to get a chance to go meet some other Real McCoys from around the organization. So I'm just... Um, I'm so impressed and inspired by our young people and what they're doing for God, and I just wanted to take this moment to, to say thank you to each one of you, <clears throat> to say thank you to you as a church. Um, it was actually a, about a 68% increase over our district offering last year. It was a pretty, I think, the third highest increase in the organization. So we just give God the glory. It's just an honor to serve at a great church in a great district and of course, an even greater God. And so I'm so blessed to be part of that. Just want to take a moment to celebrate with you tonight. Um, if you would stand with me briefly as we go into the word of God, I believe God wants to do something today. I feel a clear direction, uh, feel to speak what God has given me from the word. Uh, I believe the word, there's many analogies that the Bible gives for the word of God to help us understand, but one of them is that it is a sword, uh, the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, and I believe that sword is to be unsheathed today, uh, but not to be directed or pointed at any of you, God's children, the body of Christ, God's bride, God's so the sword of the spirit, God's word is not going to be turned on his bride, um, but sometimes there are things that can creep into our lives, and so the sword has got to go close to us to cut away the things that the enemy would try to cause to cloud or confuse or discourage us. And so I believe that today that the word is going to act as a sword to cut away some mindsets, to cut away some shackles, to cut away some things that have maybe influenced the way that we think, the way that we live, the way that we respond. John chapter 15, verse 11. John chapter 15, verse 11 is where we'll start today. And the King James Version says, These things have I spoken unto you, that my joy might remain in you, and that your joy might be full. And I would, I guess my title, if I have one today, would be Joyful. 
J-O-Y space F-U-L-L, joyful, joyful. In the Amplified Version, John 15, 11 says this, I have told you these things so that my joy and delight may be in you and that your joy may be made full and complete and overflowing. Jesus says that he wants his joy to be in you. And not just his joy, but his, jo- his joy and his delight to be in you. God delights in you, and he wants that delight to live in you. God is joyful over you, and he wants his joy to remain in you, that your joy might be full. I want to take just a moment here. I want us to pray. I know we often pray before sermons, but I'm going to ask us to really just try to plug in to the Holy Ghost, to just lift our hands, lift our voices, open our spirits, open our hearts. Let's go to God. Let's tap into the Spirit. Let's try to prepare our ears to be open to hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. God, we need you today, Lord. We want to hear from your word today, God. We want to be changed and transformed and renewed in the name of Jesus. God, we pray that your word would come into our lives and to our hearts, God. You have promised us joy. You have promised us so many blessings. You have promised us so many things. And God, right now... I'm going to tap into that spiritual realm where I can have access to the things that you have promised me, to the things that you died on the cross so that I could have. In the name of Jesus, Lord, we bind any resistance to your word, whether it be mindsets, whether it be flesh, whether it be spiritual, we bind that resistance in the name of Jesus. And God, I pray and I release there to be a liberty here, God. I believe you want to do a liberating work in your people. You want to do a work of setting free, of liberating, of making free, God, in this house today. In Jesus' name, we worship you, God. We praise you, God. We exalt you, God. We rejoice in you, Jesus. We lift you up. We praise you today. You are worthy of praise, God. You are worthy of honor. You are worthy of glory. Come on, why don't we one more time just lift up holy hands without wrath or doubting. Why don't we praise God? You are so worthy. We worship you, God. Thank you that you cause us to always triumph. Thank you that you have given us the victory today, God. We may not feel it right now in this place. We may not feel like we have victory, but you have given us the victory in the name of Jesus Christ. We believe it. We grab hold of it. We apprehend it. You have given us victory. You do cause us to triumph regardless of what our feelings say, regardless of what our thoughts may be, regardless of what our circumstances might be right now in this room, we speak faith. You have given us victory. We worship you, God. We praise you, God. Why don't we clap our hands and give God a shout of praise. You are worthy, God. Amen. You can be seated this morning. Many of you have probably heard the advertisements, especially if you're listening to a radio station in the state of Massachusetts. The state of Massachusetts has these advertisements that they play, and they explain that in the state of Massachusetts, there is a lot of unclaimed property. Maybe you've heard it, findmassmoney.com. They play those ads so often, I think they're probably using our unclaimed finances to pay for all those ad spots. But what it is essentially saying is it's just letting the general public know, hey, there is property in the state of Massachusetts that is unclaimed. It belongs to somebody, but it's unclaimed. It hasn't been received. It hasn't been taken possession of. It belongs to to those people, but it is unclaimed. The property could range from uh, physical property, like a a lot of land. It could be an abandoned bank account. It could be stocks, bonds. It could be uncashed checks, money orders, things of that nature. It could be unclaimed, you know, payroll checks that that were written. Someone, they, they belong to that person, but they never picked them up. They never cashed the check. It could be inheritances, perhaps 
someone inherited something and they never knew about it, and so they don't experience it. The advertisements say you can go to findmassmoney.com, type in your name, and find out if you have any unclaimed property. I did this this week, and unfortunately my name did not come up with unclaimed property. I'll have to check Connecticut, though. Just used to hearing the mass ones, findmassmoney.com, unclaimed property. Now, this might seem like not much of a big deal to you, but the state treasurer's office in Massachusetts is currently holding $2 billion worth of unclaimed property money resources. They say that one in 10 people in the state of Massachusetts have property that they don't know about. Across the United States, the percentage is even higher. Across the United States, the amount of unclaimed property there is, they say that one in seven people have unclaimed property. It could be worth just a couple of pennies. You don't know. You know, some little minor check that you forgot to cash or whatever. It's just a couple uh, pennies. When I paid my car off, I guess I paid too much. They sent me a check for 30 cents, you know, but but don't worry. I paid my tithes on it, so uh, I know I'm going to get blessed. One in seven people have unclaimed property. Some of those worth only pennies, some worth millions. That means if there's 70 people here today, just to make the math easy, if there's 70 people here today, 10 of you have unclaimed property. Stuff that belongs to you, but it's not in your possession. Something that is rightfully yours, but you're not enjoying the blessing of it. Something that belongs to you by right, but you don't have ownership and possession of it. But more tragically than the 10 of you that are sitting here with unclaimed property to your name, more tragically, I believe this room is is filled with very good Christians who have a rightful claim to things of God, but are not fully living in them are not fully enjoying the blessing that God intends for them to have. There's something that belongs to them in the spirit world, something that is rightfully theirs. It's theirs by right, but it remains unclaimed and unpossessed and unreceived and unenjoyed. And God wants to make it absolutely clear to every one of us here today that it is his will for you to experience joy. It is his will for you, not your neighbor, but for you to experience joy. There's some unclaimed property in this house. God's going to deal with some mindsets, some strongholds, I believe, that, that are things that stop us from experiencing the joy of the Lord. And then we're just going to practice at the end of the service, just rejoicing, just experiencing God's joy. The first one I want to talk about, the first mindset that keeps us from claiming that property that is rightfully ours, that blessing of joy that is rightfully ours, is the mindset of the saved servant. The mindset of the saved servant. It, it, this, I would say, is defined, the, the, the lie that, that encapsulates this and, and causes us to live in this place is that I'm saved, but but let's be honest, there's a limit to what I'll experience from God. There's a limit to my relationship with God. I, I know because God is, is good and gracious that he saved me, but I'm destined to be a saved servant, earning my keep, toiling away in the kingdom of God, just barely making a, a, a enough in the kingdom, enough of a difference for God to keep me around. I don't deserve, and I'm not good enough to really experience all that God has. As for me, the mindset of a servant. I know that I'm saved, but, but I'm just a servant. I'm just a lowly servant in the kingdom. But I want you to know that joy is an essential part of your salvation, and it's intended for you. Isaiah 12, 2 and 3, and I'm going to read some scriptures here today. I'm going to try to be as, as 
efficient with time as, as possible, but I want you to see in the Word of God what God says to you so that you know this is not just a motivational speech or something to try to make you feel good, but that it's the Word of God. Isaiah chapter 12, verse 2 and 3 says, Behold, God is my salvation. I will trust and not be afraid. For the Lord Jehovah is my strength and my song and has also become my salvation. Verse 3 says, therefore with joy shall ye draw water out of the wells of salvation. How do you do it? You do it with joy. God wants you to experience salvation. God wants you to drink of the wells of living water and to do it with joy, not with sadness, not, not with condemnation, not with doubt and fear, but with joy to experience the salvation of the Lord. The people of God, they're given a promise that they're going to be saved in this prophecy that occurs in the Old Testament and this imagery that it has of of, of the well, drawing water out of the well. Now now to us with our running water and our water fountains and and, and all the, you know, this this nice baptismal tank that we could, you know, fill just by flipping a switch, it's, we don't really understand that, but imagine that you're in the desert. Imagine that you're in the hot, the the, the arid, the dry, the barren country, and and you're, you're on like a camp or something. You're, you're not in a, an airplane. You're not in a, 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 a car. You're not in some type. You're, you're, you're desperate for water in a hot and barren and dry land far away from home, far away from the, the place where you grew up, far away from, from your dwelling place. And God says there is a well of cool and pure and refreshing water. And it might be a hot, barren land, but salvation is the cool, refreshing water that God wants you to experience today with joy. We fast forward to the New Testament, very familiar verse, because this, this prophecy uh, looks forward to it. In, in the Old Testament, it's like it, it things happen and it casts a shadow backwards. And so there's a shadow here of what's coming in the New Testament. John chapter 3, verse 5, Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of the water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. What's the first thing you got to be born of? Water. You got to be born of the water to enter the kingdom of God. So we've got this well. And what happens? What do you do to get water out of a uh, out of a well? You take a vessel and you lower that vessel into the water of salvation. It, it becomes fully submerged in the water so that the water can fill the well and then you pull it up. So this, this prophecy is looking ahead to baptism in the New Testament that we are to be baptized fully submerged in the water and that's how we go to the well of salvation and we draw out that living water. I'm thankful that I've been baptized today. Are you? I'm thankful that I've experienced God's salvation in baptism. And not only that, but if you have never been baptized in Jesus' name, God wants you to experience the well of water. God wants you to experience the salvation that we draw uh, water from, that we draw life from spiritually. Not only that, but but in verse 2, it says, Jehovah has become my strength and my song. He's also become my salvation. That's looking ahead to the name of Jesus because Jesus means that Jehovah saves. So the prophet Isaiah said, Jehovah is become my salvation, giving us an indication and a clue that I should be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of my sins. And I do it with joy. And I've seen people get baptized and I've seen the joy on their faces as they experience salvation. Joy is an essential part of your salvation. God wants you to experience joy. God wills for you to experience joy. Not only that, but, but it, further on in, in the book of John, Jesus came and, and said to this group, he said, hey, if anyone thirsts, come unto me and drink. What do you do with water that you take from the well of salvation? You drink water from the well. So Jesus said, if you're thirsty, come to me and drink, and out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. But this spake he of the Holy Spirit. God wants you to be filled with the Holy Spirit, with the evidence of speaking in tongues. That water is not just, the, the water of salvation is not just something you get submerged into, but there's a spiritual water that enters your life and will flow into you and out of you. 
It's the Holy Ghost. It's the whole, that's just one verse. It's all throughout the Bible. That's the Holy Ghost. We do it with joy. And I've seen, uh, I think some of the most joy I've ever seen on faces is when I've seen people receive the Holy Ghost for the first time. Am I the only one that's witnessed that you've seen? You you don't even have to sometimes hear them speaking, but you can just see their face just erupt in the joy of the Holy Ghost. Joy is part of your salvation. It's not something maybe you'll earn someday, but it is part of your salvation. There's many facets of salvation, grace, faith, repentance, baptism, the Holy Ghost, endurance, sanctification. There's just many facets. But God wants you to have joy. God wants you to have joy. He says that we will rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory. But if you really are honest with yourselves, do you feel like that describes you? Joy unspeakable and full of glory. I hope that it does, but I fear that sometimes uh, and often somewhere along the way of this journey of living for God and pursuing God, we, we get a little bit separated from that initial joy of salvation. God wants you to have the same joy of salvation the moment that you're born again for the first time. He wants you to experience that 20 years later and probably many, many fold more. But often we are not living in that place of joy unspeakable and full of glory. I know God wants you to have joy. The the, the Bible says in Romans 14 that the kingdom of God is not meat or drink, but it's righteousness, it's peace, and it's joy in the Holy Ghost. That's the kingdom of God, joy in the Holy Ghost. And sometimes we're good on righteousness. I'm living right, and and I've been working on the peace thing. I've been trying to experience the peace of God. But God also wants you to have joy, joy in the Holy Ghost. Uh, How many of you believe that today? God wants you to have joy. So what do I mean, the saved servant? Draw this from the, the parable of the prodigal son. The prodigal son, and we won't read the whole thing for, for time, but the prodigal son is the son of, of a very rich man, and, and he demands his inheritance. He leaves the father's house, and he goes out into um, far off and, and just wastes with riotous living and all this partying and stuff. He just wastes his father's inheritance, finds himself in a horrible situation, comes to his senses, and he concocts this plan. I'll go back to my dad's house. But I won't go as a son, I'll go as a servant. And I'll tell him, listen, Dad, if you just let me back in, is it's rough out here, if you just let me back in, I'll be your, your servant, I won't even be your son. And so the prodigal son comes back to the father. If we took the time to read it, the, the father uh, runs to him, and the, and the son, the prodigal son, begins to rehearse the speech that he practiced. And the father doesn't even let him finish. It, well, what he says is shorter than what he practiced. The father doesn't even let him finish. But he says, no, uh-uh. we're going to have a party because my son is back. You're not going to be a servant in my house. You are my son. And God has a word to encourage someone today. You are the child of God. God is your father. He died for you. He adopted you into his family. And you are not dead. Yes, it's, it's important that we are servants of the Lord. And, and that's a whole thing. We could talk about it. That's real. That's awesome. But you are a child of God. You are not destined to only live as a servant, just kind of in the background, scraping by, trying to do enough to earn your keep. But you are a child of God. You have rights in the kingdom of God. There are things that belong to you as a son. So we have this mindset of a safe servant. I know I'm saved, but but I'm not going to experience everything that God has for me. I want you to know no matter how far, if you feel you've fallen from God, you feel you've messed up in sin like that prodigal son, you feel like things you've done, things you've walked away from, things that that maybe you in areas you've failed, I want you to know that the Father runs to you today and he meets you with open arms. I'm so glad. I love you so much. I I just got to give you a big hug and I got to start a party. I'm not looking for another servant. I'm just so glad to be with my child. That's how God feels about you. That's the joy of the Lord. But the elder brother, he always knew he was a son. And he gets mad. He says, hey, dad, you did all this for this loser. Ruined everything, messed up. 
What about me? The father says, you've always been with me, and everything that I have is already yours. A lot of us are like that older brother. We don't realize everything that God has given us is already ours. This book is a promise to me. And in my mindset a lot, well, you know, if I was more like Bishop Hanson, you know, he's probably going to experience some things and, and I won't. Or if I was more like this person or that person, no. The Bible says that God is no respecter of persons. The Bible says that he is the same yesterday, today, and forever. If he put it in his word and he told the disciples they could experience it, I can experience it. If he told the, the, the first century church that they could experience it, then I could experience it. Because he's not a respecter of persons. I'm a child of God just like they were. It's by right. It's mine. Everything that God has for me. Last night we were at a family party. We were playing this game, this little, you know, party game, and it had, these cards had to be passed out. And so our little cousin Grayson was there. He's four years old, and he was helping pass out the cards. He, he was, you know, running around the living room, like, tripping, and falling, and dropping cards, and he got this, like, butterfly catcher net or something. We had to all put the cards in that, and he'd bring it over to the person that was reading them. And be honest, he wasn't doing an awesome job. It wasn't the greatest performance I'd ever seen. But his family, all of us there, we didn't want him to participate in the game so that he could do a really good job and be the most efficient card passer outer. What we wanted is that little boy to be part of what was going on. And so we gave him a little job to do. We didn't even need him to do it. But we just gave him a little job so that he could be part of the family, so that he could take part in what is going on. And, and, and we get stuck in our heads sometimes. Uh, like Bishop alluded to earlier this morning, I, I got to perform. I got to be good enough. I think I messed up. I dropped the cards. I gave one to this person. I was supposed to give it to that person. God's like, I, I just want to have a relationship with you. I'm just glad you're in the living room. I'm just glad you're running around and laughing and smiling and giggling and talking. You might not be getting it right, but you're my son, and I just want to be with you. That's how God feels about you. God, I pray in Jesus' name that you would help us today, that our mindset would not be of a servant who is saved, but that we would embrace that we are children of God. We are children of God. We are children of God of God. Hallelujah. The next mindset is that of disappointed dad. Mindset that causes us to struggle with experiencing the joy of God. Disappointed dad. The lie says, okay, I know I'm a child of God. I know there's things that I struggle with. I know there's mistakes I've made, my mess ups. And God is, he's just so merciful. He's not going to kick me out. I know he's not going to cast me aside. He's too merciful. He's too kind. He's too loving. But man, he's got to be disappointed in me. Dad's got to be disappointed in me. I messed up again. I failed again. I keep struggling with the same thing. I keep like hitting my head against the wall. I think dad is probably disappointed in me. And I'm here to tell you that God is not angry at you. God is not disappointed with you. He greatly desires his joy to be in you. For you to be full of joy, unspeakable. But we perceive often in our humanity, we perceive God as an angry father. In Matthew chapter 7, Jesus is, is telling, talking about prayer. In believing that you can actually receive answers to your prayer. And, and in Matthew chapter 7, he, he uh, tells the, the listeners there in that situation that, you know, how many of you, if your son came to you and he asked you for, you know, let's say some bread, how many of you would turn to your son and you would hand him a stone? Oh, no, yeah, no one's going to do that. At least certainly if you did, you wouldn't admit it publicly. So everyone's like, no, 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 no. Your son came to you, your child comes to you asking for water. How many of you would give him a snake? Oh, no, 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 no one would do that. He says, you being evil fathers, Matthew 7, 11, you being evil father, you them being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children. 
how much more shall your Father, which is in heaven, give good things to them that ask him? That party we were at last night, it was a birthday party for our niece, Lily. And Lily loves to bake. And so, as her birthday is coming up, she asked her grandpa, say, Grandpa, it would be really nice to get a KitchenAid for my birthday. Now, she's 10 turning 11. It's like, it would be really nice to get a KitchenAid. Now, in case you don't know, those bad boys are expensive. <laughs> That's not a cheap gift for an 11-year-old. That's why she asked her grandpa. She asked Uncle Nathan, it would have been like, well, here's this handheld whisk. <laughs> you go like this, your arms get really strong. It's about $12. So she asked grandpa for the kitchen aid. And so, of course, you know, her dad, when she, when she had asked him, who was like, oh, Lily, you know, don't ask for things like, you know, don't, don't do that. So she's talking to my wife uh, yesterday morning before we went to the thing, I think it was, the party. And she's, uh, you know, on the phone with her, and she says, guess what? What? I'm getting a kitchen aid for my birthday. No, you're probably not. I doubt that. You know, why would you think that? Why would you think you're getting a kitchen aid? Come on, don't be ridiculous. You know, trying to like play off and keep the surprise. She says, well, I asked grandpa for one. And guess what? She got last night. She got a kitchen aid. She has faith that her grandpa will give her good gifts. But us as the children of God. We sometimes don't believe and can't wrap our minds around the fact that God wants to give us good gifts. God wants to give you good gifts. I know there's some things in your life that aren't working out. I know there's some circumstances that right now are coming against what I'm trying to say. But I am here in the word of God trying to build a foundation. God wants to give you good gifts. It is his good pleasure to give you the kingdom. He loves you. He wants you to have joy running over. Joy that is full. We have the image of the disappointed dad. But you know, God can't be disappointed in you. The definition of, of to disappoint is to fail to meet expectations or the hope of. The problem with saying God is disappointed is that God knows all things, and God is not limited by time. So God already knows every mistake that you're ever going to make. And still, he loves you. So he doesn't have some hope that you're, oh, I was, uh, I was believing John was going to be a perfect Christian. And boy, wow, he really let me down when he overslept his alarm and didn't pray. I'm just so disappointed in my ch-. No, no, no. He already knew every mistake that we were going to make, and he loves us anyways. And guess what? When he was on the cross, he already knew. He knew every mistake, every failure, every person that was going to mock him, every person that was going to scorn him and and blaspheme his name and still he went to the cross for each and every person that has ever lived uh, he knows all of our struggles and still he loves us still he was willing to die for us God is not your disappointed dad God is not your angry father he is a good good father the prophet Zephaniah he prophesied during a time of, of judgment when God was uh, really about to release some punishment on his people because of, of how they'd been living. And, and, but even in the midst of this prophecy, which seems mostly negative of, you know, judgment and things that are going to happen, we get to the end of Zephaniah and Zephaniah 3.17, and we get an insight into the heart of God. The Lord thy God in the midst of thee is mighty. He will save and he will rejoice over thee with joy. He will rejoice over thee with joy. He will rest in his love. He will joy over thee with singing. Wow. Hallelujah. 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 Thank you, Jesus. He sings over me. 
That blows my mind. That's crazy to me. God takes time out of his busy schedule to sing over me, to rejoice with joy over me. God is not your angry father. God is not disappointed in you because your life isn't everything that you dreamed and wanted it to be. God is not angry at you because you failed. God is not disappointed with you because you've sinned. He's, oh, he's up there looking at his children. I can just picture like a father holding his newborn baby and just singing over his newborn baby, just singing a lullaby, a big, strong, powerful man, just cooing, just making, you know, nonsensical noises, trying to get that little baby to smile. That's the relationship that God wants you to see. That's the vision, the image that he wants you to see of how much he loves you. We're, we're trying to deal with some things that, that, that are robbing us of joy. We're trying to, trying to defeat some of the devices of the enemy that are robbing us from joy. He's not your angry father. He's not your angry father. Let's just take a moment. Let's just extend our hands like a little child asking our dad to just pick us up and hold us. God, let your love be here and let us feel your joy. God, unstop our ears to hear your song as you rejoice over us. You rejoice over us, oh God. Let there be liberty in our thinking. Let there be freedom in, the, <coughs> in our perception, oh God, of you. Let your joy begin to rise in your children. Let your joy begin to rise in your children. You're not looking for performance or perfection. You're not looking for penance, but you want to have a joy-filled relationship with your children. I'll just quickly mention a third mindset, and then I'll, I'll focus on the last one for the sake of time. A mindset of essentially being overwhelmed and weary of the world's wickedness. Well, I'm not going to take the time to go through everything. And I'll be honest, you get to studying joy in the Bible. I mean, I had to cut out like 40 verses because Bishop gives time limits. And, and you guys don't want to like pass out here. So God is so good, but we are surrounded by the wickedness of this world. And you see this in many of the prophets in the Old Testament, how they would just become overwhelmed with the wickedness around them. And I'll just make this one quick point, that discernment can be such a blessing and a gift from God to be able to discern what is happening spiritually and be spiritually aware and sensitive. But it can be that you can get discouraged from what you're being made aware of, that you're becoming so in tune, and, 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 and maybe you're aware of how the enemy is working, maybe in politics, or, or you see a news story, and it's someone that's just like a, a, you know, whatever, they're not spiritually sensitive, that's just like a random story, but to you, you see the, the spirits that are at play there, and, and maybe you're even sensitive to things that are going on in the body of Christ, or whatever, and, it, and it's easy. Uh, Habakkuk talked basically about, in the beginning of his prophecy, about I'm just overwhelmed by, it's like the good is just totally surrounded by the bad. And that will come along, and that will choke our joy. That awareness, it's good to be aware, it's good to discern, it's good to be wise to the enemy's devices, but we can be so aware of it, so attuned to how the enemy is, is working that it will come and it'll just choke, it'll suffocate, it'll throttle our joy. And God wants us to be aware, he wants us to discern, but he wants our main state of mind to be that of a joyful child who's saying, I know things are bad, I know circumstances are not good. And at the end of Habakkuk, he says, maybe the, the, there won't be anything to drink, maybe there won't be any harvest, maybe there won't be 
anything, but yet I will rejoice in the Lord. And we got to have a yet rejoicing. Things might not be going well, yet will I rejoice. Things might not be working out, yet will I rejoice. Things might not, so I might be overwhelmed by all the bad news, yet, yet, yet will I rejoice in the Lord, yet will I experience his joy. Weariness, wearied by the world's wickedness, wearied from the, the battle, just pushing against it and struggling to maintain our, our righteousness and continue to make forward progress when it feels like everything is against us. The last mindset I want to talk on today, and I don't even know if it's so much a mindset as, as a, I guess, state of emotion or state of being that you might find yourself in. But the pain of sorrow can extinguish the joy of the Lord. The bitter taste of sorrow, the stabbing pain of grief, could be the loss of a loved one, could be the betrayal, being cut out of a loved one's life, could be the gut-riching anguish of watching a child or a loved one as they choose to not walk with God. Could be the shattered pieces of a dream that's been broken. Could be the crushing blow of hope that's disappointed. Could be the slow suffering of waiting for a promise and maybe this time it'll happen and no it doesn't. Maybe this time it'll come to pass and it doesn't. Just this slow, kind of agonizing pain. Sorrow will come into your life and unfortunately, it's unavoidable, but sorrow will come and it will snuff out the flame of joy. It will snuff out that flame of joy. I felt as I was preparing this, and then I felt it again from really the beginning of service, I felt a grief and a sorrow in this place today. That there is a sorrow in some of these awesome, wonderful, precious, beautiful saints of God the children of God, there are some griefs. There are some things that have caused hurt and pain and sorrow. And I really feel uh, what I just discerned is, is, is that there's some sorrow associated with loved ones, people that you are close to. Whatever the circumstance or situation may be, maybe it's not directly sorrow related to your life and your specific situation, but of watching pain and suffering in the lives of people you love. And that situation that you're in will, in your life, it is so easy for that and, and really so logical, so reasonable for that to come along and to snuff out your joy and to steal your praise, to cause you not to rejoice. The cold reality is that sorrow is an inescapable part of life. We are all going to face it at some time. It's not, I don't believe, it's not just like, you know, some thing we can cast out, you know. In Jesus' name, I shall never feel any sorrow or any pain or any grief. It is going to visit all of us. It is at one point or another, we're all going to feel the sting and the pain of sorrow and grief. And so I want to be so compassionate as I just start to wind this down. There is no rebuke at all. I don't feel any rebuke in my spirit. I don't feel any conviction. I don't feel that God is saying in any way that if you were a better Christian, you would, you would have conquered this sorrow. If you were, you know, more spiritual, you wouldn't struggle with this. I don't feel any of that. But I just feel the loving compassion of a father who sees his children in pain, who sees them hurting, who sees them wounded, who sees that things that have happened in life have caused them to feel grief and feel pain and feel sorrow. And he wants so badly to come and to meet that need, to address that wound, to bind up that broken heart. It's like in life, you're, you're, you're nurturing the flame of joy, and, and then just out of nowhere, just a, a bucket of pain, a bucket of sorrow just gets dumped, and it just extinguishes what you've been nurturing. I know what it's like to see someone that you love and care about so much, to see them throw away 
everything that's good. I, I felt that heartbreak myself before. I don't know anyone's circumstance. I don't know anyone's situation, and, and I'm not trying to compare in any way, but I know the heartbreak of seeing someone else that you love and you want to protect so much and you just want good things for them to see something enter their life, to see self-destruction enter their life, to see them hurting and in pain. I know the hurt of, of getting cut out, of getting pushed aside, of, of, of getting held at arm's distance. I know the hurt of being turned away and your love that you are trying to extend being rejected. And so I just want, I just feel such a spirit of compassion from God here today. In fact, uh, God is, is not, he's not afraid of your pain, your sorrow, your situation. He, he's not turned off by it. He's not looking at you like, you know, if you really had it all together. But, but we read in, in Jeremiah, and Jeremiah is known as the weeping prophet, the weeping prophet. Prophet, He wrote the book of Lamentations, a man of God who sat down and said, I'm going to write a book about a bunch of discouraging things. I, wow, that's great. I can't wait to get to it in my Bible reading. We're going to do some lamenting. Jeremiah was close to the heart of God. He felt anguish for God's people. And he says in Jeremiah 31 verse 13, and this is what God wants to do for someone today. Then shall the virgin rejoice in the dance, both young men and all together. I will turn their mourning into joy and will comfort them. There's a comforting presence of God here today. The comforter is here today. The comforter is here today. I will turn their mourning into joy and will comfort them. Then what happens? And make them rejoice from their sorrow. As I studied it out, it, it almost seems in the Bible as, as if sorrow and joy are, are almost like opposites on the opposite end of the spectrum. And so you often see, you know, joy turning to sorrow and sorrow turning to joy. Now, maybe you read that verse and, and it's like, well, you know, that just almost sounds cliche. We're going to turn their sorrow into joy. And But I'm going through something and, and, and there's something in my spirit. There's just a wound. There's just some broken heartedness in my spirit. So, so I appreciate that verse. But, but if we, you know, the, maybe you'd think the context, you know, there's probably something wonderful that's just happened. There's some great, incredible thing that's just happened. And so everyone is rejoicing as a result of circumstances changing. If my circumstances changed, it would be a lot easier to rejoice. So maybe that's what the verse is saying. But, but if we back up just three verses to Jeremiah 31.10, we find out that the people of God are scattered they're scattered. And so this prophecy that is coming forward says, Hear the word of the Lord, O ye nations. And watch this. And declare it in the isles afar off. And say, He that scattered Israel will gather him and keep him as a shepherd does his flock. What it's saying is everyone's scattered right now. The, the children are not home. The, the, the people of God are scattered throughout the world because of things that have happened. But guess what? Declare it even in the aisles of far off, even in faraway places. Begin to declare the word of God that God will gather again his people and will bring them again. And he will turn uh, our sorrow into joy. He will comfort us. It hasn't happened yet. I'm still a long ways from home. I'm still far, far off. My brother got sent this way. I got sent that way. We're far off from each other, but I'm going to declare right now the word of God. He will do it. Even though my circumstance hasn't changed, I can feel God's joy. I can rejoice in what God is doing and going to do right now. You'd stand with me as we get ready to close. God is here to comfort. You do not have to put on a brave face today. You do not have to be, you know, macho, apostolic person today. God is here to comfort. God is here 
to strengthen. God's here to turn sorrow into joy. So how does that actually happen? I'm no grief counselor. But I know that you can't receive something new into your hands when you're still holding on to what you have right now. And so what I feel that God wants us to do is to express and release that sorrow. I don't think God wants us to, you know, stuff it down and, and ignore it and, and try to put it in a, you know, put it in a drawer somewhere. You know, don't, don't ever come out. Just, I'll probably visit you sometimes. And maybe there's some heartache. Maybe there's some sorrow. Maybe there's some pain that you have shoved to the corner and pushed to the side. But God doesn't really ask us to do that. A good father doesn't ask his child, hey, don't tell me how they were bullying you today and how someone hurt you. No, no, no. Tell me about it. What happened? I want to hear about it. Express what happened. Release it to me. Express it to me, your father. And so God is not looking for us to hold on and to carry our sorrow and our pain, but to be willing to express it and release the grief and the sorrow and be honest with him about whatever we're going through and whatever we're struggling with. And I'll close with this verse, and then we'll just turn this into a house of prayer. And I believe God is going to minister. I believe if we will open our hearts to him, some of these mindsets are going to begin to fall away. I believe there's going to be ministry here that happens. I believe that God is going to minister to you and that one, and one another you'll minister to each other and begin to take steps towards just a deep, pure joy that is not your own joy, but it is the joy and the delight of God abiding in you. Those griefs are so heavy. They're so heavy, and that sorrow is, the weight of that sorrow weighs upon you so much. But one last time, I'm praying that you would have a vision of our Lord, that you would have an image in your mind of our Lord as we read from Isaiah 53, verse 4. Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. That mess and that messianic prophecy. Jesus is explaining all, or what is being explained is mean things that are going to happen to him. But along the way, he says, hey, I'm here to carry your griefs, to bear your briefs, and to carry your sorrows. God is not asking you to carry that sorrow by yourself. He's not asking you to carry that pain by yourself, but a Savior with, 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 with scars in his hands is stretching his hands to you saying, will you give me your sorrow? Will you give me your grief? Will you give me your pain? Will you give me your hurt? I, I just, my child, my son, my daughter, I just want to carry it for you. I want to carry your sorrow for you. I'm not asking you to carry it. I'm not asking you to be strong. I'm not asking you to have the answers. I'm just asking you, can I carry your sorrow and your grief and your pain today? Because... Even though the situation may not be instantly fixed, I want you to experience joy despite circumstance, despite disappointment, despite failure, despite pain. I want my joy and my delight to remain in you. A final thought. My dad is a foreign language teacher, and so he would take trips overseas go to, you know, France or wherever. They do all these foreign language student trips, take trips overseas, be gone for, you know, 10 days or 14 days or something like that. And let me tell you, I was so excited when I knew that my dad was about to come home. When I was about to be reunited with my father. Now, I knew that he usually brought home some good gifts for me. But that's in the word. 
It's God's pleasure to give you the kingdom. God wants to give you good gifts. But I'm just inviting you. Sometimes even good Christians, there can almost be a distance that comes between the father and the child. And God is here to close that distance today and to embrace you and wrap you in his arms and to love on you. And so I would invite whosoever will to begin to make their way to this altar and to just turn this into a place of worshiping our Father, of opening our hearts to him, of pouring our hearts out to him. Maybe it's the mindset of that servant that God wants to free you from and to let you know and to whisper into your ear, you are my child. You're not earning it today. You are not earning your keep, but you are my child. Maybe you feel that God is disappointed in you. God is here today to let you know, I am not disappointed in you. Maybe you had a father that was not the best father. Maybe he had his struggles. Maybe he was an angry dad. That is not your heavenly father. Your father is here to comfort you. Maybe you're overwhelmed with the wickedness of the world and your joy has been choked because of the many things that are going on around you. But God is here to give you a yet joy. Yet will I praise him. Yet will I rejoice. Uh, maybe there's sorrow in your heart. Maybe there's some pain and some grief. Maybe there's some things that people are going through in your life that you care about and you love. Surely he bore our griefs and carried our sorrows. The comforter is here. The comforter is here. The joy of the Lord is here to become your strength. The fullness of joy in the presence of the Lord. Oh, how he loves.